Ben at 10 o'clock, and we're live on LinkedIn, live on YouTube, live on Facebook, Twitter, formerly known as Twitter, now X. That's going to be weird. Anyway, we're live in person as well, so uh, let's get started here. Hello, Smart Money Tree Podcast listeners. Welcome to this week's show. My name is Kirk Chisholm. I'll be your host, and today I'm joined with uh, my good friend, Doug Hagerin. Hey, Doug. Happy Monday, Kirk. Happy Monday. All right, well, let's just dive right in. It is a, it is a happy Monday for me. And uh, I, I love this time of year. My kids are going to Halloween it's, uh, tomorrow, and they're all dressed up. And they they're at the age of uh, they're uh, not they're just starting to be teenagers. So the costumes they come up with are starting to be pretty humorous. Uh, and I have two boys, so you can imagine the the hilarity that ensues with costumes at that age. Um, anyway, I won't get into what they are because this is a family show. But uh, anyway, so we got uh, we got some things I want to talk about now. I first want to start talking about uh, markets, uh, which, of course, is why you're listening to the show. Uh, but I, I wanted to actually I tried to do this last week and I forgot, but I wanted to touch on uh, market performance. Now, we don't talk about this in the show that much because that's not really the point of the show, but I did want to use it for context. And I was looking every week I get a summary of last week and then year to date. So last week, everything was horrible, pretty much, unless you're in the dollar or utilities uh, or natural gas or Bitcoin, Ethereum, pretty much everything else did horribly. Now, that's all well and good. And that's any given week. It goes up, it goes down. But I did want to point out the year to date numbers because I don't think a lot of people really, truly understand what's going on. Now, um, one of the things that I'd like to point out here is that um, a lot of people look at the S&P. That is the standard fare for indexes for the U.S. If you're a U.S. investor, you're kind of looking at the, the S&P 500 as your index of choice. Now, there are also a lot of people who use the Dow. Now, the reason they use the Dow is not because the Dow is better. The Dow is only 30 stocks and it's 30 large cap stocks. So it's not really an indicator of the market. The S&P is a much better indicator of the market. It's not the best one. But it's what everybody uses, so we rely on it because everyone else does. And I don't like to think of myself as a follower. So just because everyone else does it doesn't mean you have to do it. But you should know that everyone references it. So it's a good idea to use it for reference only, right? Now, we look at many different indexes, so we're, we're comparing and contrasting different things. Small cap, large cap, international, emerging markets, bonds, all of it. We use these multiple different indexes because we want to know what is the perspective of what's going on in the market. Now, I do want to share, because I think this will be helpful, is uh, a few months ago, uh, the I think the NASDAQ was up like 35 36% at the high, something like that from the bottom. And the Dow, I think, was up like 16 or 18% from the bottom. I'm sorry, not the Dow, the S&P. Sorry, I missed a quote. Uh, the S&P was somewhere up about uh, 16, 18% from, from the bottom. And the bottom was December 31st of last year, coincidentally. Actually, technically, it was October, but it was right around the end of the year. So the market started at the lower point of the range of the last few years. And then it was at, went to the higher end of the range. Great. Oh, wow, look at all these returns. Not necessarily. What people failed to notice this year is that, first of all, the, the NASDAQ is now down to only up 20% and the, the S&P is only up, uh, da, 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 it's like 7%. Really? Is that right? I thought it was higher than that. Okay. Only up 7%. Wow. So <laughs> the S&P has gotten clobbered so far this last few months and the NASDAQ has too especially since the NASDAQ is mostly a few mega cap stock tech names. And it's mostly tech to begin with. So tech does well, NASDAQ does well, tech doesn't do well, NASDAQ doesn't. Uh, so I, that's why I don't like using the NASDAQ because it's, it's really just tech. Now, the S&P has gotten clobbered so far from the peak, right? Now you might say, well, yeah, but it's still up. Yeah, it's still up. But in context, it's you have to put this in the greater part of the market. Now let's look at the Dow. The Dow is down 2% this year. Now, the media likes to talk about the Dow, and this will be a, a lesson for all of you uh, home gamers. The media likes to talk about the Dow, which is why people reference the Dow, because the Dow has a bigger number. The overall index has a bigger number. So rather than focusing on the, um, 
uh, I'm just trying to pull it up here to see what the actual numbers are as of today. But rather than focusing on a smaller number, instead of saying, wow, the S&P went up 100 points, you can say the Dow went up 1,000 points. And that's maybe a bad example. But the point is, is it's great for TV. For TV, you could say, wow, it's going up so much, 1,000 points. And meanwhile, it's really only up 3% as opposed to 100 points. Well, actually, it's not maybe not a good example. But anyway, um, so 3% in both, it's a much better example to use it on the Dow than it is for the S&P because the numbers are larger, right? So as of now, the Dow is 32,000, the S&P is 4,000, case in point. So when you see the media referencing the Dow, it's because they're trying to manipulate you. Not deliberately, but they're trying to get you to pay attention is probably the more accurate thing. They're trying to bait you to watch their show, which is why they're on TV, because they want you to watch the show. So keep that in mind when you're seeing those things, that that is important. Now, let's compare uh, pretty much everything else. So let's see if I look across the board across the world, most things are down for the year. Now, you might think, wow, we're doing well. Most things this year are down. Here are the things that are up. It's, it's going to be quicker to name the things that are up than, than down. The NASDAQ, the S&P, uh, uh, communication services uh, sector, uh, consumer discretionary is up, uh, information tech. Okay, those are the sectors. Now, other, other global indexes, Frankfurt, I can't read this. Uh, Paris, sorry, my I need I need glasses, Doug. Uh, Paris, Tokyo, Korea are up, and the dollar, the pound, uh, gold and silver, uh, oil. Na uh, actually, natural gas is down a lot. Uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and uh, two ten and thirty year treasuries. I think that's the yield. It's got to be the yield. Um, yeah, that's the yield. So everything else is down. Shocker. No one's talking about that. And so I want you to keep in mind what's actually going on compared to what you're actually hearing on TV or reading on the news or some channel of your choice. You need to understand what's going on because people are not doing you a favor. They're trying to get your attention. So as I talked about last week, cultivate your own news sources. Find out places where you can actually hear what's going on. And this is hopefully one of those places is why we do the show because we're trying to educate you to become better investors. We don't care where you invest. You can care. You can invest with yourself. You can invest with us and invest with some other advisor. I don't really care. That's not my goal here. My goal here is to educate you and help you become smarter investors. Now, I'm going to point one thing out, and we're going to move on to other things because there's a lot to talk about. I want to talk about this last week. and never got the chance because there's so much to talk about right now, and the market being one of them. Um, I want to talk about correlations. Now, Correlations are different from causations. Now, those of you who haven't heard me talk about this before, you should. Uh, correlation and causation are different, right? If I punch Doug in the face, his nose, his nose is going to bleed. That is a causation. Now, if Doug's nose starts to bleed and I don't punch him in the face, but I'm thinking about it, that's a correlation, okay? So understand there is a difference, and we do confuse them a lot in this world. We do see something happen and then something else happens. Say, oh, it's because of causation. Not necessarily, right? It, it's We don't always know. We don't always know the reason why things happen. And people look at stocks and bonds and say, oh, well, stocks go up, bonds go down, and vice versa. That is a causation. No, it's not. It is a correlation. And what we're going to talk about here is, is a little more perspective on why it is a correlation and not a causation. Now, the Wall Street Journal was nice enough to, to, to supply us with this chart. I'm gonna share it here. So those of you uh, home gamers that are just listening, uh, go to the website, go to YouTube, go to all the places that we are live and you'll be able to see the recording of this. Um, really important chart, seen it a bunch of times, but I also want to show a few other charts. So this was put out by the Wall Street Journal, the correlation returns from the S&P 500 and long-term treasury bonds. Now. This is basically the stock versus bond correlation. So historically, from our perspective, when stocks go up, bonds go down, vice versa, that's why you put them both in your portfolio so they balance it out and they have less risk, as you're told, uh, in, in, uh, in pretty much everywhere, even though that is an incorrect statement. Now, if you look at the last 20 years, that's been correct, right? 
stocks and bonds are inversely correlated. You might say, yeah, that's that's a causation because when one goes up, the other goes down. No, historically, that's actually not correct. Historically, it's much more complex, which we're going to show you. Now, this is the Wall Street Journal back to, it looks like, uh, the 40s, uh, 45, it looks like, to right around today. So whatever that is, that's about, what, nine, uh, I'm not going to try to do the math, but 80 years. Um, so what you'll notice here is in the last 20 years, there was a inverse correlation, which, like I said, stocks go up, bonds go down, vice versa, right? However, from late 60s into 2000, there was a positive correlation, which means stocks went up, bonds went up, stocks went down, bonds went down. Interesting, right? That's not what we're used to. I started 99. I was accustomed to this inverse correlation. Everybody told us inversely correlated. That's how it works, even though it obviously hadn't prior to that. So what's interesting to me is that you have a whole industry that has a perspective of a truth in air quotes, right? Truth is in air quotes. Um, it doesn't actually mean it's true. It just means that this is their perspective. Now, I shared the quote last week from Marcus Aurelius about truth versus perspective. And so understand that when you have a positive correlation like last year, right? And for those of you who weren't paying attention last year, last year, stocks and bonds both went down. Unless you were in cash or pretty much gold, I think, uh, everything lost money. I mean, there might've been some things went up, but virtually everything lost money last year. It didn't matter what you were in. There was no safety net anywhere. So as you notice in the chart, that is a huge spike up um, to two decade highs, according to this. But the point is, is it's, is it's a huge spike of something that people were not accustomed to. So the 60-40 portfolio lost you a lot of money last year. Normally it's protected because the last 20 years it was, but it wasn't last year. So those of you who think that your portfolio was safe last year and didn't bother to look, probably didn't realize that it wasn't at all safe and you didn't realize why. It's because of this. It's because the stocks and bonds both lost money last year. And if you look back at the, the late 60s to the uh, 2000s, that happened a lot. You were not protected during those periods of time, especially in the 70s and the early 80s, when pretty much when bonds were going up, which means you lost money in bonds, stocks were also losing money. And when bonds went down in yield, then the then basically the price went up. That means stocks went up. That happened a lot. Now, I keep coming back to this paradigm that we talk about. There is a paradigm shift that happened in the last few years. The paradigm, sh this is a illustration of that paradigm shift. Now, I've been talking around the point. This is one of the symptoms of the paradigm shift. It is correlation in comparison to stocks and bonds. It's the paradigm shift that things have changed and no one has noticed. So if you're not hearing about it on the news, it's because they're usually the last ones to know. If you're not hearing about it from your favorite fund manager, it's because they haven't noticed either. People are not paying attention to the assumptions that we all make, right? One assumption is, is that the risk-free rate, which is based on the US treasuries, is the basis, the foundation of all of finance and investing, all of it. If we were to ever default on treasuries, the whole system would implode because that one assumption. 2008, real estate always goes up, was a base assumption that everyone made. What happened? It turned out not to be true and the whole system imploded. So we have these base assumptions on certain air quotes facts and what ends up happening is, is when those quote unquote facts aren't true, then the whole system implodes because everybody is assuming that they're true. You should always check your assumptions. And here is an example of this. People have not checked their assumptions. If they're assuming that we're going to go back to inversely correlated stocks and bonds, you're going to have a lot of bad performance from 60, 40 portfolios and diversified portfolios because people aren't diversifying properly. That is a huge problem. Now, what you're going to see here is if this trend continues, and I suspect it might, if this trend continues, then you're going to see a lot of confused investors. We talked about before the 70s was marked by mass confusion amongst investors. They didn't know what was going on. This is a good reason why. There are many reasons. This is one good reason why people are confused. 
What are you talking about? Stocks and bonds. That's the basis of all finance. No, it's not. That was based on a uh, academic study, which was turned around and used by Wall Street as a way to sell more mutual funds. That's all it was. It's not that it's inaccurate, but it's not accurate 100% of the time. It is a thesis, like most of economics. It's a thesis until proven wrong, in which case they come up with a new thesis and they follow that until that's proven wrong. Economics is a art, not a science. And there's, there's a reason I got a BA instead of a BS, although it probably should have been a BS for economics. Um, so understand that these correlations are going to change things. Now, I do want to point something out before I give it back to Doug, because this is also really important. I pulled up. So once somebody mentioned this, and, and I want to say where I found this, because it, it's not something even I knew. I was not thinking, hey, this is the problem. I knew in the back of my mind that this had happened last year, but I was thinking, I was like, you know, I wonder if this is true. I, I wonder if that's a one-off deal. And then somebody made a point uh, on this show, actually, and they said, historically, and actually, I don't think that episode's come out yet, so you're hearing it here first, even though technically it was, I give them credit. Um, so I did some research, pulled up a bunch, bunch of charts and realized that the correlation does not hold true. It only was the last 20 years. If you look back at history, it's not the same. So I'm, sh I'm going to show you a bunch of charts and it's going to confuse the heck out of you. And I'm going, to I'm going to point them on the show. But I just wanted to point these out because when I pulled up information about correlation, it was all over the map. The data was skewed and the Wall Street Journal was only the last 80 years. If you go back hundreds of years, it shows kind of the same thing. It's all over the place. So you can't hold it as truth because it's different. What is true is in pockets of time. So if you look at the chart, the last 20 or 18 years on this chart, but basically if you can pull it back, it's the last 23 years. <clears throat> correlation um, and inflation have a pretty, you know, they're, they're, they're bunched together. Now, if you look at inflation when it goes higher, now this and stock correlations uh, are positive, inflation goes higher, things are a little bit different. So I don't love this chart by PIMCO, but it's interesting to look at to see how the data lines up. Here's the next one. This is the UK. And I'm only pulling up the UK because I couldn't find a lot of data online. I, and I'm not going to sit there and pull the data myself because honestly, it would take forever and it's, it's not worth it. Um, so I'm going to pull from sources that hopefully are accurate. Now, these are sources that people rely on, so they might be inaccurate. But for the for the point of this show, I think you're going to see some interesting stuff. So <clears throat> this is the UK bond and equity correlation back to 1759. Now, in the UK, it's actually been positive correlation. This is a 10 year rolling, by the way. There's not a year to year. It's 10 year rolling, um, which gives you a different data set. I will tell you <clears throat> this is more of a blended uh, correlation than a year to year because a year to year might be very volatile, but this is blended. So it's more of a accurate um, depiction of a trend rather than the data. The difference being the trend is an aggregation of the data. The data is just the data. So looking at this equity bond correlation in the in 1759, it was actually really high <clears throat> and it it only got negative in looks like 1887 around there a few times and then in uh the early 2000s it's been negative since but it's been positive for the last few hundred years that's interesting that's not what we've been told now the uk well it's the uk it's different it's not the us we live in the us some people live in the uk so thank you uk listeners for listening um but you know here's another one and this is also the UK, but this is stock and bond correlation uh, as well. And this is a similar chart, but it just shows it more stretched out. So it's easier to see. Um, here's here. Here's where it is for the 12 month total return correlation between the S&P 500 and U.S. Treasuries. OK, here's the U.S. Here's something interesting. Now, if you look here, if you look back at 100 years, so for 100 years up until like 1950, it was positive. From 1950 till about uh, late 1960s, it was negative. From late 1960s till about 2000, it was positive, and now it's negative again, right? And if you look at last two years, uh, last year, it was positive again, right? 
So this only goes to 2018. So just keep that in mind. Um, here's a 10 year rolling of US equities and treasuries. So this is more of a blended, like we talked about. This is the trend, not the data. Um, and this, this goes up in this here, if you look at the last data point, this is May 22, uh, which actually it showed positive. I don't know why that's showing there, but anyway, uh, it's positive. So if you look here, you look, it was mostly positive back to the 1900s and only recently it was negative. So I point all these out and here's another one. I'll put all these in the show notes. I'm not going to spend too much time here, but I just point these out because I want everyone to understand that we take things for granted. As an investor, you always take things for granted. This is one of those things that if you take it for granted, it will cause you to lose a lot of money. Now, the problem with investing is there's so many data points that conflict and your job is to make sense of it all. It's really hard to make sense of it all. That's why <clears throat> on this show, we don't tell you what to think, we tell you how to think. We're trying to teach you how to think about investing. And the way to think about investing is through frameworks, or some people call them mental models. And you stack these frameworks on top of each other. And through that, you'll have a better accuracy on investing in the world. So think about it as a lens, right? I don't wear glasses yet, but I probably should. Um, and if I'm looking, if you have glasses, you'll notice that every once in a while, they'll adjust your prescription, right? It's because your lens compared to your eye is not seeing the world as accurately as you'd like. So they adjust it. They put on another lens and another lens, and another lens, another lens. They keep adding, I, I'm, for this illustrative purpose, they keep adding lenses or they keep changing them, right? Because the view on the world is not 100% accurate. That's what mental models or, or um, you know, frameworks are, is they're lenses on the world. And you keep stacking them until it becomes more and more accurate. So you have all these different stacks of lenses of how you see investing. And then when you take them together, like, oh, I see it clearly now. But if you only had one lens of major media or you know your, your academic textbook or whatever it is, if you only have one lens, you're gonna miss the boat and you're probably gonna end up losing money because the next 10 to 20 years are gonna be ugly. I've not talked to one person who's, who's really positive about the next 20 years. I'm certainly not, but it doesn't mean you won't make money. It just means that it's not gonna be like the last 20 years. I need to wake up to the fact that that's the truth. So if your expectations are sky high that you're just gonna invest in, in big tech, Magnificent Seven, Fang, whatever you wanna invest in, and you're gonna make 50% a year, you're deluding yourself and you're gonna actually probably lose more money than you're gonna make. So use these mental models, stack them, learn them, understand them, and apply them to your own investing and you're gonna have a lot more success. So we will keep adding mental models over time because that's what we love to do here. We love to come up with new mental models and help you understand the world so you can apply it to your investing. So, Doug, I know we've got a ton of stuff to talk about today. So where do you want to start next? Well, I just want to talk just a couple quick things to note on what you just said, but I know we want, we need to move on. Number one, I think it's also really important because people will a lot of times make their investment decisions based on averages. And they'll love to talk about how the average of this, the average of that. I've talked about this a couple of times over our last conversations. There's a big difference between average return and actual return. Here's a perfect example. You know, people say, oh, the S&P 500 averages 8%. Um, and okay, that may be true. And I think that's very skewed depending on the window in which you're looking at things. And I've said a long time ago that the average of the S&P 500's return has been going down steadily for a long time, actually. Um, a lot of those averages were built up decades ago, which have very little impact now. Uh, the other aspect of that, though, is, I mean, for example, we've talked about how 2000 to 2013, the S&P 500 didn't make money, right? Well, the average return from 2000 to 2010 was flat. They call it the lost decade. The actual return was negative. Um, here's a great mathematical example. If I were to take a 50% loss and then I was going to give you a 100% return, okay, your average is going to be 50%. It's wonderful. Wonderful return. You're like, hey, I can make 50% here. No, the actual return was zero. OK, so I think it's really important that a lot of people are touting this. And and here's here's something I've also talked about is in, in order to lose, you know, in order to fight this diversification narrative, in order to fight this, you know, counter this um, narrative of, you know, di of getting help and, and where to look. A lot of people out there have have used the argument just invest in the S&P 500. And you just as you just said, even if the averages have been strong, 
what's going to be the next 20 years. We've been through cycles where people have lost an entire almost generation of working years to the S&P not performing. Well, Jordan Belfort, if you're not familiar with him, the Wolf of Wall Street, not necessarily someone who's had a history of being someone you should probably be listening to. However, he's still got a massive following of people listen to him, even though there's an entire movie about how he basically tricked people on penny stocks. Okay. <laughs> well, that being said, I don't know why, you know, the more you trick people, I mean, Michael Milken is also has a huge following of people. I mean, it's funny how these people that got, not, you know, that got, you know, infamous based on fraud have so many people that actually listen to their advice still these days. But he just came out, and ironically, he just came out and said the S&P 500 is still the ticket to riches. Now, let me make something clear about investing. Nobody has ever said investing in the stock market is the ticket to riches. Okay, It might be the ticket to being a millionaire next door through steady saving, but that is not how you get a ticket to riches. Riches are made generally through other things like starting businesses, welcome to capitalism. You know, Wealth was never created rarely ever created just by investing. Although there is an example, and that's Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett has made his money through investing. And, and, I'll, this, and I'm, gonna, I'm using this example because Jordan just came out and said, you should just invest in the S&P 500, right? Yep, I don't trust Wall Street, just invest in the S&P 500. Wonderful, wonderful diversification there. Warren Buffett has come out and also been quoted as telling people you should just be investing in the S&P 500. But I also want to quote something that came out last week. Charlie Munger, I have said this forever, that the reason that, that the reason that Warren Buffett has said to invest in the S&P 500, he's effectively telling you, you're not smart enough to do what we do. Okay. So just do that. Because if you try to do what we do, you're going to fail. Well, Munger just came out and basically said the see that, that, that the truth behind where everything he's, that I've been trying to say, he said, if people weren't so often wrong, we wouldn't be rich. Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have no interest in encouraging to in encouraging others to buy the same investments they hold. Right. So there's a perfect example. He's come out and said it himself. Just buy the S&P 500. They really don't want you investing in what they invest in. Okay? And the reality is is they understand how to do the research. They understand how to find the areas that you need to adjust to and buy and hold on to. And again, when people are swimming out, that's when you should probably be swimming in and vice versa. Okay. So in this case, going back and just holding an S&P 500 or holding a 60-40 portfolio, these things are not going to build riches. These things are going to have years in which the actuals wildly differ from the, from the averages. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you're, if, if you don't know how to make those strategic moves and diversify differently under different cycles, then I encourage you to get the help of someone who really does understand it. Because as Kirk just said, you know, we went from 2000 to 2013. Now we may go in the next 20 years with the average return of the S&P. There will be barriers to make money, but they may not be the same as they were the last 10 to 15. And therefore you'll have to adjust with that. Yeah, so I think it's great. And I want to actually point out a, a follow up from from Doug here. He's talking about Warren Buffett. Most people think Warren Buffett made all his money from investing in stocks. That's actually not true. And I'm going to I'm going to break Warren Buffett's facade here. He is a great PR. He, he has great PR, you know, Incredible. old Warren, old Uncle Warren, you know, you know, uh, living in Omaha, drinking his Coke and his, you know, and all that stuff. Uh, he's got great PR. Okay, there are many great investors. That's just the that's just the PR that he's taken. He's old Uncle Warren. He's actually a really ruthless investor. Okay, he just doesn't come across that way publicly, and he has done a great job in educating the public, and I appreciate that. So I, I'm not it's not ripping on Warren, ripping on the old guy day. Um, he's done a great job at, at educating the public and helping investors invest from a value perspective globally. So kudos to him. Thank you for all you've done. Uh, but now I'm going to tear them apart a little bit. And it's not I'm not doing it in a negative way. I'm just pointing out the um, inconsistencies of his PR versus reality. Now, most investors who follow him already know this, but most of his growth has actually come from insurance. And it's not because insurance is a great industry. It's because of what it does for his business model. And only recently have some people actually mirrored 
his business model, maybe about 10, 15 years ago, some people tried ineffectively. Some hedge fund managers have done it ineffectively. Um, basically what Warren did is, uh, not, not to get into too much detail, but basically what he did is he bought an insurance company. And he, with insurance companies, you have to understand every single business in the world borrows money and pays someone else to borrow money. So if I wanted to grow, I have to pay somebody right now, probably 15% a year to borrow money from them to grow my business. Kirk, they don't all pay cash. I thought that's the only thing. Just everybody should just pay cash. Not in my business, Doug. Oh, okay. Some businesses they do, but <laughs> I don't live in that world. That's the uh, the loan sharking world. I don't live there. <laughs> but yes, yeah, some people do accept cash and only only cash, um, which actually is a segue into my next segment. But anyway, so the so Warren Buffett's business is insurance. Now the benefit to insurance, it is the only business in the entire world that has this business model. And the business model is this. If I run a business, Doug runs a business, we have to pay someone to borrow money. That's why there's restrictions on growth because if I pay somebody, that's less money I have. I'm basically pulling future earnings into today, right? I'm saying, give me a million dollars today and I'll pay you uh, I'll pay you the million dollars back in five years after I make 10 million with it, right? So there's a million dollar drag that eventually I have to pay back. Insurance doesn't operate that way. Insurance is the opposite. Insurance is, hey, I need to borrow money. You're gonna pay me to borrow money. Here's how it works. I start a property casualty company and I get a million you know, people who wanna get insured, right? Every year they give me $1,000. So every year I get a billion dollars a year in revenue from these people, right? A million people, a thousand dollars, it's a billion dollars a year. Okay. Now I take that billion dollars and I put it in a bucket. Okay. Now every year, let's say 5% of those people are going to file claims. I don't know what the number, let's just say it's 5%. So instead of making a billion, I'm actually only making, you know, 950 million. Okay. That's how, I'm, that's how much I have every year that goes into this bucket. So 950 million is in this bucket. Now, at some point I have to pay those people back. I don't know when, could be next year, could be 20 years from now, but that money accrues in that bucket. Now I take that money and I invest it into whatever stocks I wanna invest in. Let's say Johnson Johnson or Coca-Cola like Warren Buffett did, right? So Coca-Cola invested it. I invest that in the, I think it was the 70s, 60s, 70s and invested in Coca-Cola. So you put that in the bucket, and then invest it. Coca-Cola grows, you know, 10x, let's say, over that time period. Uh, so now my 950 million is worth 9.5 billion because it grew over that time. Now, eventually, I still have to pay back the 950 million, but now I just leverage myself to 10 times that. So I can pay it back at some point. And now I've got all this, this extra money, right? That's where he grew his wealth. In every business you have to pay to borrow money, he's getting paid interest for borrowing from other people. And then he goes and invests it. It's a crazy business model. It's the best business in the world if you do it right. It's a hard business. I'm not saying everybody should just go out and do this because it's a very hard business. And some really smart hedge fund managers have tried. I think Third Point, I think David Einhorn tried as well, uh, Greenlight. I, I believe they both set up insurance companies and did not do it successfully. I, I, I didn't look at it for like the last 10 years, but when they did it, they had a rocky start. Um, I'm not sure if they're still doing it, but the point is, is they're really smart people and they weren't killing it in insurance. It's a hard business. Warren Buffett has figured out how to do it right. So kudos to him for figuring that out. So don't think of Warren as a great investor. He is, he's a good investor. He's a great investor for figuring out the insurance model. That's that that is the Warren Buffett secret that people won't tell you. Um, but I did want to point out one other thing because we, we talked about Jordan Belfort uh, being a crook, which he is. Um, I also want to talk about another crook, and that's the U.S. Treasury. And uh, great segue here, right? And <laughs> here's here's why, right? So crooks tend to lie to you. They tend to pull the wool over your eyes because they want. They have some other nefarious purpose, maybe not necessarily nefarious, but some other purpose that is in their interest and not yours. Here's where the U.S. Treasury is not aligned with you. I saw a uh, report out. I'm trying to find it. It was a report on how cryptocurrencies were funding terrorist attacks by Hamas. 
So here's the here's the here's the, uh, the the headline. In recent days, following the horrific uh, terrorist attack by Hamas in Israel, we've seen um, terrorist groups using cryptocurrency. Um, and and and, and I, I'm just paraphrasing there because it goes on to other stuff. All right. So let me just point this out. This is a frequent thing by the U.S. government. If they want to. Uh, get rid of something or they don't like something in favor of something else. They want you to use dollars instead of cryptocurrency. As, as we all know, that's the truth, right? They don't want to break their own monopoly on our currency. So they come out and say, well, cryptocurrency is causing this. Well, good thing that cryptocurrency holds up to that scrutiny. Now, <laughs> I point this out because the benefit of cryptocurrency is it's transparent. Unlike the U.S. Treasury, unlike the U.S. dollar, unlike all these other things that are only partially transparent, not fully. The good thing about let's use Bitcoin as an example. Uh, there are most cryptocurrencies are transparent, but this one especially is. So there's a site called uh, Chainalytics or Chainalytics, what are you going to call it? Chain. An they do chain analysis on cryptocurrency, which means if you state something is true, they can actually go back and assess whether it's true or not. So they actually did a study, study and, and they said, uh, basically what it said was this is all BS. So there is no proof that uh, that uh, this attack was funded by cryptocurrency. There's no proof whatsoever. But the US government came out and said there is because they can say that and very few people are actually gonna look. I didn't look, I'm not an expert in chain analytics. analytics. That's not what I do. So. Maybe this is true, maybe it's not. But the point is, everyone's going to believe the government because they said it, right? And how many times do you believe the government, Doug? I, I don't, I don't believe them very much. But you, you know, I, I'm, I'm starting to believe in Jerome Powell, although he said the same thing 47 times and followed that one. But that, yeah, that's yeah. it for the moment. That, that's a new thing for uh, for the for the. Fed. <laughs> it's a they, new they thing for the Fed. That's why nobody believes him, and they keep betting against him. I know. And then it's like the boy who cried wolf and then the wolf shows up and people don't believe him. That's kind of what's happening now is the wolf's here. Um, Although his, the, his predecessor, Janet Yellen, has really been interesting as the Treasury Secretary. Secretary. Well, she's the one who said that comment. She, she right. and, and I'm trying to pull up the comment. I can't find it here. But she's the one that made that comment that cryptocurrency has funded Hamas terrorism against Israel. I know. I'm not saying it didn't That's happen. the most effective chair, chair ever. But anyway. I mean, yeah. Why? I mean, it's. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Anyway, but I did want to point that out because we, we hear so much bunk on TV, both from the government and from media, that you have to take everything with a grain of salt. It, it's, it, you know, did it, it, is there one instance where that happened? Maybe, right? But I'll tell you what the biggest, the biggest way to fund terrorism is, the US dollar. There is no bigger currency in the world at, at at funding terrorism than the U.S. dollar because it's so widely accepted, right? And it, it's not that the U.S. dollar is the cause, right? The, what I'm saying is the cause is because it's so widely accepted that people use it, right? Whether it's drug dealers, terrorism, all the all the crime in the world, U.S. dollars are a big part of it because it's widely accepted and it's used everywhere. And it's not like oh, we've got this small currency in El actually El Salvador is a bad example because they're using Bitcoin. Um, you know, in Guatemala and saying, oh, well, this is this is like going to fund terrorism with Guatemalan pesos or whatever they use. It's too small. It would be easy to track. Right. So they use the biggest, most liquid currency. That's why they do that. Right. And banks are also big, big supporters of terrorism and, and drug. Uh, and I, and I, hopefully I don't get get a, a, a knocking at the door by ATF for for uh, for saying this. So if you if we go off the air now, you know why. <laughs> um, uh, if, if I, if I die suddenly, you'll know why it's not because I, I did anything myself. <laughs> well, well, Kirk, but, I was confused for a second when you said that the U S dollar funds the most terrorism. I thought you meant the money that the U S government was actually giving to terrorists and, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, no, freedom that, fighters in other parts of the world. That's a, that's a totally different story. I'm not going down that road because I don't want to get canceled, Doug, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but that is also true. But the, the, the point is, is when you, when you look at these things, keep everything in, in context, right? is that banks also fund terrorism. They also fund drug dealers. And I wouldn't say they overtly do it because that would be illegal. But are there places where that happens? Absolutely. Because the, these these criminal organizations have gotten really good at obfuscating the law, right? And so, you know, when you see this happen, it used to be there were banks that, that openly uh, accepted 
uh, money from organizations that say they shouldn't, right? And now the world has cracked down on that, so it's less likely to happen. But the point is, is there are many places where it inadvertently happens. Now, do, now people like Doug and I have anti-money laundering, AML things that we have to adhere, adhere to to make sure that we don't uh, inadvertently cause those things to get into the financial system, right? So the whole system is built around uh, insulating from those people. But it still happens, right? Nothing's perfect, right? It's like cybercrime. You know, people know what the rules are, but it still happens. So just understand that um, anytime you hear like cryptocurrency is bad because it supports terrorism, one hundred percent bunk. Okay, in the case of that news story, it might happen. Sure, it, I'm, I'm sure it happens, right? There are many ways to obfuscate uh, the law, but it, it's the point is, is it's not the reason it happened. Is it a part? Maybe, right? Just as any currency, gold. US dollar, whatever, it, something's going to be a part because people have to exchange goods and services. But is it the cause? No, it's not the cause. Okay. Um, all right, Doug, I'm going to let you take it and we're going to keep bouncing back and forth here because let's get into some real estate stuff. You, 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 point, you sent some good charts here. Yeah. So where are we going to go with this? There's some incredible stuff on it. Um, I think, uh, well, you, pull, you know what? Why don't you pull up a chart and we'll talk through it because there's there's quite a few ways to go on this one. Which, what's an interesting one you want to talk about? I don't know. We'll just kind of Perfect. go in the, in the nature Perfect. of where you want. Well, you know what? This one's good. And this one, this one, actually, I'm going to segue, which I think this was really interesting here. It'd been my background of college planning. Um, this isn't, this isn't uh, real estate, but this chart has to do with the fact that they are finally starting to increase the, the level of education in schools around personal finance as a graduation requirement. Um, and there's been plenty of talk about individuals, about uh, how the educational system has uh, has really underemphasized the need for financial literacy, um, and that uh, kids are coming out of school more, you know, you know have, have come out of school saying, "Look, I, I never learned anything about finance." Well, you know, the problem is you can learn all you want about Animal Farm, which great book. My daughter is now studying this book for the second year in a row, um, in you know, from you know, two different two different English classes on you know on the same exact t uh, subject. Great book, great history, great reflection of the history of, uh, of what happened with the, uh, you know, the Bolsheviks and uh, what happened in, you know, Russia, you know, so Russia to Soviet Union. But you know what? At the end of the day, that's not going to necessarily translate effectively and immediately to the real world. In the real world, it comes down to one really very simple thing. You need to be able to survive monetarily. I mean, and that's the truth in this in the United in, in the United States, in almost any place. You've got to be able to bring in enough money to support yourself and you've got to be able to make that money last and you got to be able to use that to cover what's expenses are today and also have some level of plan to prepare yourself for the future because systems just it's not going to be there at the level that people want or desire to maintain a lifestyle that they enjoy and mean that, that they can live meaningfully. So. Guess what? It is really, really important to teach this, and they have it. So it's really good to see that there are more and more states that have started to realize and you know and recognize the impact of not giving basic financial education. I know there's been a lot of people who have tried to work hard on this. Whether you agree with their education, whether you agree with their approach or not, I know Dave Ramsey has created some stuff that they're they're trying to put into school. You know, more and more schools. Um, I know a gentleman by the name of Don Blanton. Uh, who's behind uh, something called the personal economic model. He has created PEM Life that has been designed for education within schools. And then, of course, you know, some, many, many programs are just implementing their own curriculum. Um, now, for, as it says here, 40.5% of U.S. public high school students will be guaranteed, uh, will be guaranteed, um, I don't know if that's meant to say required, to take a personal finance course. Um, and I think that critically, you know, this is a great a step in the right direction. Again, I'm involved with college planning, and, and I think some, a lot of the education system that we are in right now, the way things have been taught, a lot of the stuff that's taught, I think, is unfortunately not necessarily indicative to a successful outcome once they're in the real world for the future, although I think all information and knowledge is important. This one, I think, directly uh, co contributes to the better welfare of those that are graduating. So it's a great chart. Love that one um, to see that happening. Um, I guess one of the things I want to go, there's a chart that we've got um, here uh, that's talking about, uh, let's see, uh, a gentleman about the housing market about to crash. A uh, gentleman by the name of Steve Harney. Uh, my personal opinion on this gentleman, if he's on Twitter, he's he's 
you know, in the end, what, what happens, and we've talked about this before, is sometimes the uh, the the information you need to take at the most extreme skepticism is those that come from people that are inside the industry. They have a lot of bias, um, but it's also good to listen to anybody, whether they're you know on any side of the fence, because I think it helps to build perspective and. Let's face it, as we talk about, there's truths, there's untruths, there's half-truths. I think what happens is a lot of these, a lot of times this information is provided with a lot of half-truth. There is reality to this. For example, the number of foreclosures are nearing all-time lows. Quarter number of consumers new foreclosures in the thousands. And you can see here that it has significantly dropped. That if you go, if you if you look at the trend that was from the end of the Great Recession, the major financial crisis of the of the aughts. Um, steady decline to the point that even before we got into uh, the, the stimulus of post-2020, you could see that the number of foreclosures were wildly lower than they had been even prior to things escalating, uh, you know, in the middle of, of the first uh, decade of the, of the, of the, of the I'm sorry, of the, tw of, uh, the 2000s, of the, cent of the century. So um, obviously the foreclosure moratorium made it helped uh, significantly. You can see a massive drop during those years. It is now ended. The trend line's coming back up, but the trend line's still uh, still significantly lower than before. Again, it looks like, look, everything's fine and dandy in the real estate world. A couple of things, though, that need to be read into this is that, the, it, and we've talked about this too, the last thing that people are going to not spend their money on is going to be housing. Like at the end of the day, I don't, you don't care how many bills stack up, people don't want to end up on the streets. Okay, so we are starting to see a trend line go up. We also saw a tremendous amount of reprieve through stimulus, through extended unemployment. We saw lots of people, uh, lots of people that were able to pay down or keep those mortgages or pay things down, you know, and that didn't have to deal with student loans and, for, and foreclosure moratoriums and lots of those other things during that period. So I think, I think there's more to that data than's being shown there because it makes it look like the housing crisis, you know, the housing is just fine and dandy. And a lot of people talk about low interest rates. Nobody's ever going to want to get rid of their homes. And I understand that. That's true. But at some point, cash flow only goes so far. Craig, you know, what Kirk is now showing here, obviously, I think is much more indicative. And again, it's a, you know, the real estate is a laggard to other areas of financial crisis. The number of borrowers who are 60 days plus late on car payments, significant spike. And we have not seen this level since what, 1996, 1997. It exceeds okay. that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. So we're talking, I mean, you, most people would probably agree, well, geez, we would have seen a lot of that 2006, 2007, 2008 during the crisis. Interestingly enough, that number of individuals who were more than 60 days late is not even the biggest trend line that we've seen since 1990. It was actually worse than that, as you can see here, going into the latter part of the 20 teens. So like 20, it looks like it probably crossed in around 2016, 2017. By 2018, we were already exceeding the number of individual car, uh, individuals who had car payments past 60 days. Of course, again, that dropped. So that correlation of the foreclosure moratorium on the other chart, you can see that. I know people in the debt, uh, the debt industry, they did very well starting in 2020 because people spent a lot of money, stimulus money, paying down debt. But look how rapidly it has spiked and it is now as high, if not higher, than it was in 1997. And again, this is something where it is collateralized debt. You get behind. Eventually, they can come and they can take the car. Okay, so that's something that's not going to necessarily put you out on the streets, but it is a sign of the cash flow challenges that people are facing. And guess what happens when that continues to trend? When you get behind a one, the interest rates go up, the back payments go up, all of a sudden there becomes the slippage. So credit cards start getting behind, cars start getting behind. You're going to fight, but eventually you might sit there and reduce your utilities because they might get behind. And then all of a sudden, guess what lags behind that? People no longer able to pay rents and no longer able to pay on their mortgages. So again, don't know where this trend. We're not. We've said this before. We're not in the. We're not in the business of predictions. But if I had to look forward at this trend, I would not be surprised if we start to see the being even more. Uh, start to see a, a, a rise in the number of foreclosures 
in, in real estate coming as a lagger to this. Now, buying versus renting. Here's another one. Data suggests the decision has never been more clear cut. The premium discount to buy versus rent. It's 52% now more expensive to buy than it is to rent. Okay. Previously, that peaked in 2006. So it makes it very, very difficult to buy right now because of the amount of the, the, the amount of money that you must get from banks and, or if they'll give it to you in the first place in order to pay these escalated prices. We've talked about this before. It's like, well, prices are staying high. That must mean that the real estate market is, is still in uh, high demand and still healthy. You know, no, the reality is, is that, again, this comes back to the issues we talked about, like the 70s, right? Just because just because pricing staying high does not mean th that all things are good. Okay, so what we have is we have a very, very limited number of supply. People don't want to sell right now because they start, you know, because they are locked into these these really low interest rates. Um, they also don't want to go from a low interest rate and buy a new home at a high interest rate unless they have to. You know, so there's going there's we're starting to see less supply on the market. So when there is supply on the market, a low supply does not take a lot of demand to create equilibrium. Okay, so we're not at a point which the demand, of course, has been reduced at along with the supply. So therefore, you're going to be, continue to see maintain at least for now high prices on whatever homes are listed. Doesn't mean they're going to move. Some of them will, and at the higher uh, the higher uh, cost level you're going to see that the people that can afford to make those types of transactions, it goes back to probably the old saying that says, if you have to ask the price, you probably can't afford it. They aren't necessarily going to a bank and saying, please finance me on this the same way that a lot of people are going to be when you start getting into kind of the, the middle range of cost. We are, we are definitely at a standstill. One thing I've been seeing, I don't know if we have any char charts up here for this, Kirk, but I'm seeing a lot of arguments that say, you know, that start to say that the correlation that clearly people that own a house, they have more wealth, right, than people who rent historically. And and again, I if you see something like this, I want to kind of read into, the, you know, to bring you up to another way. This goes back to the beginning of our conversation today, causation correlation, okay? Is this a sign that if you have an, if you're an owner of property, that you will then become more wealthy okay so that would be a causation or is this a sign of correlation or maybe a reverse causation that those that have real estate either are correlated in terms of better financial management in the first place or maybe they were already going to be or were already on the trend of being wealthier in the first place allowing them the flexibility and the financial affordability as well as being lent to by the banks because of better credit to buy the real estate in the first place. Again, so I, I'm seeing a lot of this coming out there. It does, you know, just because you say, well, look, people who are wealthy own real estate must mean that owning real estate makes you wealthy. Make sure you're not getting caught up with that. While that could be true, it could also mean that people that were already becoming wealthy are the ones that were able to make the investment in real estate versus the ones that are renting may never have, have, it's not that the renting kept them from being wealthy, they just may never have gotten to a position where they could buy real estate in the first place. So there's a lot of variables here and a lot of data that's coming out that's mixed. All I can say to this is, look, look around right now. If you think the data is telling you things are fine and rosy and you look around your neighborhood and things look fine and rosy, great. But most people are looking around going, this doesn't seem to smell right. Kind of like inflation, right? The federal government just came out and said inflation's really tempered down again. It's, you know, it, it may ratchet it up a little bit, you know, back over 3%. Everything's good. The reality, you know this, go to the store, buy your groceries, look at your utilities, buy your gas. Obviously, inflation is not as low as you're being told when you think about how you have to divide your budget up, the stuff that you have to spend on that are very difficult to get out of your budget. These things, I mean, for example, maybe you're not going to go out and buy a new car because they're so expensive, but you got to repair your car. Kirk, later today, I got to go pay $3,500 to repair my car. Now, good news is I don't have a car payment, right? But what do I have? I have an opportunity, I, you know, I have an opportunity to keep this car. It's certainly going to be cheaper in the long run than having a car payment or a new car. But again, I've got to pay very expensive pricing for car repairs 
in the short period and I have to do that to keep the car going. That tells you the difference between general inflation versus what we have to pay for to keep our lives rolling. So anyway, just things to think about to wrap that up, Kirk. I'll pass it back to you. All right. Well, Doug, when you wrap it up, I'll give some final thoughts and we'll, we'll, we'll send her home here. So where can people find more about you, Doug? Uh, listen, I talked about it before. ProCollegePlanners.com. Check it out. Get the information. I was just on a tour to college. People don't ask the right questions. Now, matter this is the business that I'm in. I'm there with my daughter. I'm the only one asking questions. You, you are about to go make one of the biggest investments of your life. The purchase of a house. 150 to 250 thousand dollars or more over a four-year period. At least for the house, Kirk, you got 30 years to pay it off. Would you really go in and make a decision to buy a house without doing any research, without being armed with information and being prepared? Because the last thing you want is to pay all that money to potentially be in debt, or worse, or worse than that, your child comes out without direction, fight, struggling to get a job, and wondering what the degree was worth. We've all read the articles. If you're prepared and you find the right college academically, financially, and socially, you may be able to have a great return on your investment. And that's what it is. So make the, get the right information, make a smart financial decision with your money when it comes to college. Great. Well, Doug, thanks for coming on the show. I'm going to touch on one or two points that Doug had made and we'll wrap it up here. So one, <clears throat> one thing there's uh, Lance Lambert on, on X had made uh, just for some stats for reference. And I want to tie this back into real estate. He said, if mortgage rates were 3%, 50 million households could qualify for a $400,000 mortgage. At 7%, 27 million qualify. At 8%, 22 million. Uh, this isn't a rate shock. It's a credit eligibility shock. Huh. That's something we've been saying in the show for like the last year. It's, it's affordability. Math? Wow. I know. It's affordability. <laughs> you could say it's supply and demand as well, which I don't disagree with. But affordability is the driver, right? If you can't afford it, you're not buying it. It doesn't matter if it's supply and demand, it's still affordability. So keep that in mind. I also want to point out um, that, you know, we had this chart here uh, of the rent versus buy. And I want to put this in context, and I'm actually going to share it with another chart after this. So what Doug was talking about is the premium discount to rent versus buy. I, I did actually a few blog posts on our website about the rent versus buy decision process. And actually, it was, it was so elaborate, it took up three blog posts, not one. <clears throat> if we put it all in one, it, it would have you know, been a book. So um, the point being is it's actually a very important decision. Now, we're renting, uh, and this is the reason we're renting, right? It, 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 this wasn't the reason we started renting. The reason we started renting was right around here in COVID. But the reason we keep renting is because of this, because it's more expensive to buy than rent. Why would I buy right now and spend 52% more than renting? I mean, people own houses for different reasons. Right. One reason is because the emotional context, because, you know, I know from my wife and a lot of women feel this way. They need it's like a nesting. They need a home. They need to feel like it's a home. And from a math standpoint, I'm a math guy. I just say, well, I don't know. It's just numbers. But <clears throat> I understand the emotional context and I agree with it. Right. You need to have a place that you feel like is yours, your, your castle. Um, however, during a period like this, it's nonsensical to buy first rent. It's much better to rent than to buy right now based on this premium discount to the, the equation. And it's not always like this. There were times like 2012 where it was better to buy. That was a great time to buy, right? The, 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 uh, the housing market had already bought them and started to come back and mortgage rates are still still cheap. And as you can see, it's as real estate gone up, uh, especially after COVID, it's got more and more expensive. So why buy, right? Just wait. It's going to come back. At some point, it's going to correct because it has to. Not because I say it, not because Jerome Powell or Janet Yellen says so. It's because it has to. At some point in time, this culture in our country is based on home ownership. So at some point in time, this needs to come into balance, which means, and I come back to the same thing I say every week in the show, rates drop, real estate prices drop, or both. Those are the only outcomes here because people aren't buying. Yes, there are homes that go for sale and they do sell. But in mass across the country, people aren't buying at the prices listed because they can't afford to. And the home that they would have normally bought two years ago isn't the same home. If I was buying a million dollar house, because that's the part of the country I live in is, you know, it's kind of more not average, but it's around there. Let's say it's a million dollars. Uh, I want to buy a million dollar house three years ago. Well, I could afford that, right? Let's say it's a four bedroom right, house uh, for a million dollars two years ago, three years ago. 
Um, now, that million dollar house is actually 1.2, 1.3 million dollars, oddly enough. Um, actually, if you look at four years ago, it was probably more like 1.8 million, uh, to be honest. But let's just say it's like, let's say it's a million. Let's say it doesn't change. But now it costs me twice as much for that million dollar home. So really, I can afford a half a million dollar home. Well, half a million dollar homes are like two bedroom. I don't need a two bedroom. I need a four because I've got kids. So there's this challenge that's out there that's affordability for what you need. And it's just disconnected. So renting makes a lot more sense. Now, I'm also going to point out one more thing. I'm going to wrap it up is <clears throat> this chart I've shown before, which is uh, it's a little technical, but it's called the Q ratio, which effectively just shows the valuation of the market. You don't need to understand how it works. All you need to understand is low is good, high is bad. So if you're buying when it's high, it means you're pretty much signing up to lose money. If you buy when it's low, it's a great value, meaning that it's hard to go wrong. Now, the 70s was marked by a lot of back and forth in the markets. It was basically range bound. It went up, went down, went up, went down, but it basically held within a range for the whole 10 year, actually plus, it's more like 14. But anyway, 10 year period. But if you look here in the 70s, it started you know above one and then ended up 0.29. So what was the best time to buy? Well, nominally, which means the price of the index, the best time to buy, I think, was 74. <clears throat> now, the best time to buy from a value perspective was 82. But the price was higher in 82 than it was in 74. But the value was better. What The difference between price and value is enormous, right? And this is what we're talking about with the rent versus buy. The value is off the charts way too expensive. The price, I mean, the price may never go down. Right. This price, wherever they are, may be the price for the next 30 years. I don't know if rates go down. They could stay where they are. Right. We don't know. Maybe pe people's wages go up so they can afford more. All of these are factors. But if you don't understand the value, the value being what we just talked about, which is the rent first buy. If you don't understand that you should be buying when the when the rent first buy is in the favor of buyer and rent when it's in favor of renter. If you don't understand that, then you're signing up to lose money in real estate. So. If you want to understand real estate, these are factors you need to know. You don't just buy because real estate's a good investment. You have to understand the numbers. You have to understand the trends and the perspective. You know, the reason we talk about that we're in a paradigm shift is all these things that we're talking about. They're really important. And if you don't understand them, you're pretty much walking, as, as they said in Wall Street, you're a man walking around with, you're a blind man walking around without a cane. You know, the reality is, is if these are things that Warren Buffett understands, we talked about Warren Buffett earlier. He's sitting on piles of cash, not because he thinks the S&P is a great buy, but because he doesn't think it's a great buy. And he's sitting on piles of cash because he's waiting for opportunities to come up, which they eventually will probably next year would be my guess. And it's starting to look increasingly like next year is going to be a big year for the markets uh, turning down and, and prices turning down across the board. We'll see. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not reading the tea leaves, but if I had to, that, that would be my that'd be my guess. So we're going to wrap it up here in the interest of time because we're going over, but uh, appreciate everyone uh, following around on the show. So that's the show for this week. Thank you again for joining us Money Tree Investing Podcast. My name is Kirk Chisholm, Wealth Manager of Innovative Advisor Group. We don't just manage your wealth, we make your life better. You can find more about me at InnovativeWealth.com. And of course, you can find me every week here on the show. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and the podcast app of your choosing. You can also check out the show at MoneyTreePodcast.com. On the website, you'll have access to the show notes, resources, and the archive shows. Also, right now on YouTube, please check out our YouTube channel. When you're there, please subscribe and leave a comment. Lastly, please leave a show rating and comment on the podcast after your choice. Oh, and don't forget, do your own research. This show is for informational use only. We're not telling you what to think, merely how to think about investing. We're also not selling any products or services, so do not consider this advice. If you have any problems with the show, I blame Putin. So please send him an email and express your feelings. If you're seeking financial advice, talk to an oracle or a fortune teller or maybe just a licensed financial advisor. I'm one, but as I said earlier, I'm not selling anything. But I'm easy to find. Have a great week ahead, and remember, no one will care about your money like you do. So invest in your life. <laughs>